good morning uh, all of you and uh, this is the 10th lecture in this series of this course uh, MM713 on aqueous corrosion and its control. In the beginning uh, we said that uh, we will have this course uh, divided into two halves. The first half corresponds to the thermodynamics and uh, kinetics of uh, electrochemical corrosion. The second half corresponding to various uh, forms of corrosion which are prevalent in the industries actually. You may call it as a form of corrosion or you may call it as a mechanisms of corrosion in broad sense. Now, this is a very practical uh, relevance and importance for controlling corrosion, for developing new materials or to developing some design aspect of it. From all aspect of it, you need to understand the corrosion as it occurs in the industry and various components. So, broadly if you look at uh, the Fatana book, it says about 8 forms of corrosion, but you go along you will see that that is not there is no sanctity. You can have you can call as 9 forms, 10 forms or even more because uh, you will notice that the way you control corrosion could be different may not be classified as 8, eight different ways. It can be classified as more than maybe 9, 10 as you see. So, the 8 forms of corrosion we still follow, but you should have a open mind to say that it is not in strict sense there are 8 forms of corrosion. Before we get into the 8 forms of corrosion, you need to broadly understand how the corrosion would occur in reality. Okay. Corrosion in reality, suppose I expose a metal to the environment and you have uh, you know some environment is exposed to, the, to this, suppose there is an environment here and the corrosion occurs. What is the corrosion here? You will have an anodic reaction and you will have a cathodic reaction. Of course, the rate of anodic reaction must be equal to rate of cathodic reaction that I think we are we all well aware of it. Suppose assume that this is a metal and corrodes as let us say m n plus plus n electrons and there has to be a cathodic reaction. I generalize this cathodic reaction as some species they accept these electrons and they get rid here. And you call this is uh, anodic and you call this as cathodic. We give some illustrations of uh, what are the possible cathodic reactions at a later stage. Right now, uh, it is sufficient to, to discuss that a corrosion reaction involves anodic reaction where the electrons are released and a cathodic reaction where the electrons are accepted. Let us look at this sample here from this point of view. You can have assume that the metal is very pure, assume that it is it is the best pure metal let us say best possible pure metal and assume that it is a single crystal or well, for some reason just assume that it is a single crystal. So, what will happen now? 
you will have an anodic reaction occurring on the surface, cathodic reaction occurring on the same surface, it will occur very randomly, right. Instantaneously, you might find you know a place can behave as an anode, a place can behave as a cathode here. Now, if this anode and the cathode, the locations are fixed, what happens? The corrosion becomes quite non-uniform, ok. The corrosion becomes uh, more at the anodic site and the cathodic site, the corrosion is not going to occur and you call that as what? You call it as localized corrosion. So, in localized corrosion, ok. If you look at, if you look at the, the nature of the place like A and C and uh, you know if you look at this, and this is going to be the cathode, this is going to be the anode here and with respect to time, they almost remain as a cathode they remain as an anode here. They are not going to change with respect to time at all and that is what we call as a localized corrosion, right. So, you will have dissolution occurring around this anode and no dissolution occurring around the cathode here. Visualize that the anode and the cathode Assume that the location A, ok. I also call this location A. Suppose I look, I call a location, location 1, location 2. I just re designate that as location 1 or location 2, and assume that location 1 it goes like this. This is time this is the nature. So, this is the cathode and this side becomes anode here. For some time it remains as a cathode, becomes an anode, becomes a cathode, anode and cathode. And this form of corrosion we call them as uniform corrosion. So, in uniform corrosion each location can act as a cathode and anode and they vary with respect to time. So, you lead to a reasonably I would say uniform corrosion all through the surface. So, broadly then I would like to classify corrosion as two types. Those occurring in a uniform manner all throughout the surface and those where the anode and cathode are fixed with respect to time, they do not really change with respect to time. So, they are all called a localized corrosion. So, these are the two broad categories of corrosion that you must be having. This is very important. The way you prevent corrosion depends upon what you understand in more detail about what is localized corrosion. Of course, the uniform corrosion is fairly simple, not that complicated. Now, you will ask the question, why is that in one case the anode and the cathode sites are fixed, they are not changing. What are the factors responsible for the location on the steel surface or some metal surface where the anode becomes you know stable with the time, the cathode becomes stable with respect to time. Let us give an example here ok and see why you get into anode and cathodic site. Let us take a practical example, an engineering example where 
you use bimetallics you use bimetallics sometimes let us say you may use let us say steel so you may use let us say uh, stainless steel you may use what happens in this case in this case the steel becomes permanently anode the stainless steel becomes permanently cathode here this is one type of localized corrosion ok and we call them as bimetallic corrosion we also call or we can call it as galvanic corrosion. Please notice here the anode and cathode are mic macroscopic they are quite macroscopic they are not microscopic right. So, here the anode and cathode are macroscopic in nature. is easily identifiable I can identify this. I give another example ok where you have a passive metal generally that can lead to what is called as pitting or called a pitting corrosion. An example stainless steel in chloride medium. What is the characteristic of a, of a stainless steel generated? It is passivated right. So, that is a passive film on the surface. And it is possible that at some place the film damage occurs. Film damage occurs. When the film damage occurs, what happens? Uh, this becomes now an anode this case right. The surrounding area becomes what? The surrounding area becomes the, the cathode here ok. So, they become the cathode. So, the anode will continue to remain as a anode and the cathode will remain as cathode with respect to time and this leads to one type of localized corrosion which is called as pitting corrosion. Please look at this is microscopic it is microscopic in nature at least to start with you know it may become macroscopic with time as the pit grows you can able to see with the magnifying glass sometime we can see with the naked eyes ok. And this is a another form of what is called as uh, microscopic form of corrosion which is called as um, pitting corrosion. We can have the other type of microscopic corrosion. We know that most metals um, in engineering applications you do not use single crystal do you? What kind of material that you use? It is a single crystal? You use normally polycrystalline metals right you use a polycrystalline metal. So, what is the difference between a single crystal and a polycrystal grain boundaries? So, generally you will have in the metals polycrystalline metals that use ok. 
you will have grains and so you have grain boundaries. They have it in in polycrystalline materials. metals and alloys you have this. What is the difference between a grain boundary and a grain generally? What do you think? Yeah. So, you have uh, in within the grain they are quite periodic you know and within the grain and in the grain boundaries they are random they are strained because the orientation of the atoms in one grain is different from the orientation of the atoms in the other grains. At the interface it tries to optimize try to adjust itself. So, it is strained. So, the energy of the grain boundaries what happen? So, grain boundary as high energy. right as high energy. So, when you have high energy what happens that becomes now an ore and the grain becomes cathode and you call this corrosion as intergranular corrosion. happens. It is more complex than what I have depicted here. We will see this again in details ok. Now, look at this the anode and cathode are fixed with respect to time grain boundaries will continue to dissolve with the time and the grains will remain as a cathode with respect to time. So, you have the other form of localized corrosion. Again please notice it is again a microscopic form of corrosion. So, again it is microscopic form of localized corrosion. Now, we will see the other form of corrosion which is uh, localized, but a relatively a macroscopic form of corrosion, a macroscopic form of corrosion, right? Let us look at a situation where the metals are joined, ok. One of the easy ways of joining metals is what by by riveting process right. So, you do riveting ok. What I do in this case take one piece you take another and use a rivet to secure that. Now, you see here what you get is a there is an air line gap and the environment inside this <laughs> is different from that on the outside. When I say outside means outside the this gap here and and you call this as and this place is called as a crevice. This is also called as this is also called as crevice. And so, 
it leads to one form of corrosion called as crevice corrosion. Please look at this is macroscopic is it important in industry they are not important metals are joined like that they are joined with rivets it may be joined like your flange joints corrosion in the flanges in the rivet could be different. So, we need to understand the mechanism we need to find if you know the mechanism you can also find the remedial measures ok. You can also try to know how to improve upon further ok. So, we will look at the, the mechanism of what is called as the crevice corrosion. This is another form of localized corrosion ok. Now, let me just go into the other form of corrosion. We use alloys. In obvious example of alloy, you know that is copper zinc. What do you call this alloy? The brass. Okay. In this alloy, you see that copper is noble and zinc is relatively active. So, what will happen now? The dissolution behavior of zinc would be different from the dissolution behavior of, of copper. So, you have it another form of localized corrosion, right. This happens at what? This happens at the atomic level, they do not happen at the microscopic level, they happen at the atomic level. In a, in a for example, if you take an alpha brass, it consists let us say somewhere between you know 15 to 35 weight percent of zinc quite homogeneous right. You really, really do not have too much of micro cycle features except the grind boundaries. The corrosion occurs, what will happen in this case? In this case zinc preferentially dissolves. Okay. And you call this as selective leaching and it occurs at the atomic level. You need to find a solution, otherwise, you cannot use brass, you cannot use this kind of brasses in seawater application, for example, you cannot use them. So, you need to understand the mechanism what is happening there, how do I improve upon the selective leaching or selective dissolution of zinc in the brass. If you remove zinc from the brass, what happens? It becomes quite porous, the strength becomes so weak, the structure cannot be holding the pressure right stress levels you cannot do that. So, this is a another form of localized corrosion occurring at the atomic levels. So, we talked generally about problems related to the alloy you know there is a grind boundaries passive film damage or a selective leaching we talked about intergranular corrosion we talked about you talked about what happens in the rivet and all. There can be a situation where the environment can cause a special kind of localized attack under the flow conditions.
environment. Okay. It can cause a lot of turbulence, right. So, when it causes a lot of turbulence, what happens? What happens when you have turbulence? It, it impacts the metal surface. When impacted, what happens? There is a metal loss. So, that is a mechanical damage plus a corrosion process, localized places, and you call this as. a very interesting form of corrosion right. It depends upon the design, it depends upon the environment all this it depends upon the geometry of the system it goes for example, is it a is it, is it, a, is it a, 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 a circular uh, you know cross section or is it a rectangular cross section through which the electrolyte is moving. This is other form of corrosion. This is also other form of corrosion which is called as other localized corrosions. A variation of that we also have a cavitation damage but these are all macroscopic. The material is not a problem not really at fault I would say more often the fault is you cannot say a fault it is a requirement you know you need to have high velocity in the pipeline that is not a fault like that it is ok. So, how do you really handle the corrosion problems in that cases this is different. So, you have flow induced corrosion we call it cavitation damage we call it erosion corrosion we call it there are several names given to the given to that we will try to understand this in detail and to so that we can find a solution to the particular problem. Now, I can have a variation of what all you have seen. Suppose I have a sample, I have a structure maybe, and that I apply a stress. And it is exposed to the environment, applied stress. Okay. So, applied stress. The stress can be tensile and you can have a tensile stress. And it can be static with respect to time ok. And you call this leads to a failure called as stress corrosion cracking. very prevalent in industries. I can have a stress which can be alternating stress. It can be it can be tensile, it can be compressive, it can happen like this or it can be tensile, tensile and such kind of problems leads to corrosion fatigue. In stress corrosion cracking again there can be um, sub classifications you may call as um, hydrogen induced cracking you may call it. Even when you have a fatigue you can have hydrogen involved in the process mechanisms they become complicated and the solution to that problem is different from a normal stress corrosion cracking. So, that is why I said you can have several mechanisms and uh, depending upon situations and the solution for these problems are not exactly the same. So, to summarize I would say you can broadly say that corrosion occurs in the two manner a uniform corrosion other is a localized corrosion. The difference between these two can be broadly again said as 
the uniform corrosion the anode and the cathode locations they keep alternating with respect to time and so the corrosion becomes uniform the localized corrosion the anode and cathode they become rigid with respect to time and so there is going to be a localized attack. The attack can be simply a dissolution process, it can be assisted by a mechanical means such as erosion, cavitation or it can be assisted by a tensile stress or a, a fatigue stress can lead to cracking. So, the localized forms of corrosion are even more dangerous as compared to what is called as the uniform corrosion. So, these are the broadly the classifications of that. So far, you have any any of you any, any kind of questions? Lots of scenarios that made Yeah, see, it's it's an interesting uh, interesting question. To make a metal as anode, and to make a metal as a cathode, it requires a specific properties. You know, momentarily at that particular location, the energy has to go up, right? Then that location becomes an anode, and the remaining places it becomes a cathode. Assume that I have let us say an aluminum and it is 99.9999 some 69 purity. There is no alloying elements. So, energy of aluminum all the aluminum atoms are same. I do not think there is much of a difference unless you associate it with dislocation or vacancies all kind of stuffs actually ok. So, in the absence of that every atom in the lattice would have similar energies. So, they have equal probability of acting as a cathode and as well as an anode here. Momentarily these atoms can become an anode because of all what at all you see electron wave you know the energies are not going to be same all the time you know there can be lattice vibrations can happen or momentarily the oxygen atom can go to the surface can lead to that. So, the various reasons you can render the particular place as an anode and then cause a dissolution. Of course, you you dissolve a metal you release electrons the electrons have to be accepted by some other species other places you get an cathode. So, all this variation that occur on the metal surface are mostly statistical or probabilistic issues. They are not really atomic issues. When I say atomic, atomic or deterministic means they have a character. The character of these metal all through is similar. Momentarily, stochastically they are changing and so they become anode and cathode with respect to time you get a uniform corrosion taking place. On the other hand, you can have a composition variation right. Suppose, you take a steel, what what does steel con consist of in a few typically if you see in the microscope, what do you see? You get a you get a ferrite matrix and you may get a cementite, a cementite is of course, located in the polite right. So, you have two phases you have ferrite phase and a cemented phase, the cemented phase is what is rich in carbon and the ferrite is very lean in the carbon content. Chemically they are different. So, you have one making as anode other becomes a cathode. So, there can be composition variation that can make the alloy locally anodic and cathodic can happen. It can happen in many of the alloy systems because in fact, the metallurgies we develop alloys with different phases that is why it gives you strength. Aluminum alloys another example you increase the strength of aluminum alloys because of what? Because by adding the elements like copper, zinc, magnesium and do heat treatment and get the strength, but these precipitates are chemically heterogeneous. So, you can also have 
that is more deterministic that is that is not a time bound process. So, you can have corrosion taking place along the precipitates. So, if you have to have uniform corrosion the one of the general criteria could be that you will have mostly a homogeneous alloy systems or even you may have heterogeneous alloy system they are not too much biased as anode and cathode they may be only marginally they are going to be different. So, it can able to vacillate with respect to time actually. So, in even normal steels you know you will see generally you will get uniform corrosion the ferrite and, and cementite are not going to cause so much effort atmospheric corrosion. But you go to a laboratory and then you are going to use a chain like picrol or whatever you are going to use it you can nicely reveal ferrite you can reveal cementite because that agent is a chemical agent it just etches out separately that is actually what is that is a localized corrosion then only you can able to see phases. So, localized corrosion would depend upon differential um, you know uh, a tendency to corrode can happen because of various reasons ok that we have been seeing all along like this only. So, generally pure metals are more prone to um, uniform corrosion than pitting all kind of stuff, but then you can have a crevice corrosion nothing to do with with, with the metal. I can have a pure austenitic stainless steel I can get a crevice corrosion why because it forms a crevice external is forming there. So, you need to understand from the context in which uh, you know, these forms of corrosion are occurring. So, we will discuss also in detail what are the mechanism governing mechanism for various uh, various localized forms of corrosion. Coming back to the point here actually ok if it is a very uniform metal and if the uh, if the alloys generally not cold worked the grind bonus are not too much energy difference you will see a uniform corrosion. In fact, I used to tell people if you take a very high pure aluminum of 99.999 finite purity they call it and then you ask to etch it you will not get the grind boundaries revealed at all ok. But on the other hand you are going to have a small amount of copper you etch it the grind boundaries are very much revealed actually. So, the purity of element is very important in, in seeing whether there is a uniform corrosion and localized corrosion at all. I hope uh, I have answered the questions actually Any, anybody else have any questions. Okay. So, if there are no uh, further questions let us move on to uh, understanding the various forms of corrosion ok. What are the various forms of corrosion first let us discuss the so called uniform corrosion. We have just now seen in uniform corrosion one of the, the most important criteria in uniform corrosion is that the the anode the cathode the shift with respect to the time actually here. In a symmetric manner I did not draw a nice sinusoidal curve ok. In a symmetric manner you will have the location anode and cathode can take place. There are several examples one is if you look at the root top ok of steel sheets. Hmm. The, the steel sheets you will see around actually the uniform corrosion. Most of the atmospheric corrosion of steel structures you will see them as uniform corrosion. So, you can say generally atmospheric corrosion steel you see that it could be even the steel it could be in hydrochloric acid it can happen in in uh, I am sorry steel in sulfuric acid steel in hydrochloric acid steel in phosphoric acid 
even in water generally they undergo a uniform corrosion ok. In all these cases you will get you might have seen pipelines around you know or steel bars lying in the open atmosphere when rains they are all practically uniform corrosion. Some confusion however, arises you know I have seen uh, when you interact with industries they say oh they look like pitting ok. What do you mean by that if you look at the surface the surface is not atomistically uniform when you say uniform please do not mistake that it is going to be very smooth you may have a rough surface you know if you touch it you will see the roughness that is not considered to be pitting when you talk about pitting we will discuss in detail what it is may be pitting when do you call it as a pitting all we can we can talk about ok. Shear roughness shear within codes non uniform corrosion is not considered as a pitting corrosion no it is not considered as a pitting corrosion. So, that uh, you know you should be able to make the distinction between what a pit is what a rough uneven corrosion is not considered as a pitting corrosion. Now, when you talk about uniform corrosion we see in what it is then we have to look at what are the factors that control the uniform corrosion. first and foremost is the nature of the environment. Ok, this is one factor that you can say. The second is the temperatures the third is uh, is uh, the the external variables like velocity of course it also depends upon the alloy nature So, let us look at one after another how they affect the uniform corrosion of the metal. Let us take the, the nature of environment ok. First and foremost I would give pH. as important variation. Actually even before that I think it is better to talk about what are the type of anodic reactions and cathodic reactions involved in the metallic corrosion ok. So, let us let us first get into the, the nature of anodic and cathodic reaction. Maybe it is coming covering there only let us let us look at this. Suppose I have a metal I think I will use I use the other one ok. 
So, let us look at the nature of reactions, then only you will be able to appreciate all this nature of reactions. Let us take an anodic reaction. I generalize as metal going as m n plus m yeah m n plus plus n electron this is anodic reaction. Let us look at what are the cathodic reactions possible. Cathodic reactions are say one a simple hydrogen ion reduction process and giving rise to hydrogen molecule. It can be oxygen in acidic conditions can react with with H plus and electrons giving rise to possible. This is in the acidic conditions right. Uh, you can number this cathodic reaction as as 1. S2. You can also have the oxygen here in the neutral medium, it can combine with this electrode, can form it is neutral or alkaline. Please look at it in both cases it can happen. You can also have simple water accepting the electron ok simple this is called water reduction. right. You can have like any kind of uh, you know oxidant uh, for you know you can have uh, let us say m x plus can combine with some electrons can become m x minus 1 plus can happen actually ok this can be some oxidant can you give an example for this you guys have seen already ferric ions right the ferric ions converted into ferrous ions you can also have one more okay let's say a metal ion can combine with this electron can give rise to metal. So, it is a noble metal. I think this is an important slide for you ok. Why it is important? Suppose you go to industry and you are given ok and one guy says uh, sulfuric acid is present. We are storing sulfuric acid in a tank. So, it is corroding. If you look at these equations, what do you think are relevant here in this? Look at these equations right, look at these equations. Tell me 
corrosion of stainless steels in a sulfuric acid tank which of these reactions are relevant here. Of course, forget about the anodic reaction that is going to happen let us look at the cathodic reactions what are the reactions which are relevant yeah tell me yeah first is relevant the second may be relevant then is is uh, third rel relevant is relevant third one one answer okay is the is uh, the fourth relevant fifth relevant you do not know ok, sixth relevant you do not know. Now, let us look at one after another first is little obvious sometimes it can be less obvious. If I am going to use 99.9 weight percent sulfuric acid you might find that the first reaction itself may not be there you will see later because sulfuric acid cannot dissociate into H plus plus sulphate ions when it is highly concentrated time we do not worry about it ok. Let us assume it is a dilute sulfuric acid do not worry about concentrated sulfuric acid. So, first question you are going to ask is that what is the concentration of the sulfuric acid is it concentrated dilute assume it is dilute. Now, the question number 1 is relevant 2 is relevant third is is suddenly not relevant. Now, the 2 is relevant or not you have to check is the tank is deaerated is it open to atmosphere you have to ask this questions you know industry guys I mean how you do the tank is not going to talk to you right now the environment is going to talk to you, you now you need to apply your mind and see what happens. So, we need to look at now we need to just look at it now of course, we can see that system is closed system no aeration, but for sure then what happens you may use a DO meter dissolved oxygen meter to say that ok there is an oxygen content present here. The question number the, the, the one 5 depends upon how does the ion dissolve if ion is dissolved and become ferric ions it becomes relevant for you that means you have to analyze the constant the content of sulfuric acid the sulfuric acid does not have ferric ions then again I rule out the 5 is not going to be there ok. And the noble metal very unlikely to happen ok unless you have some system carried away with copper ions. So, an analysis of possible corrosion processes are very important in order to diagnose the industrial problems ok. So, you need to have a broad idea about what is likely to happen at all in this case ok. So, this is these are very very important for this. Now, I have a question to you I have asked a question to you I have a carbon steel and and I have a stainless steel two scenario I am giving to you a carbon steel and a stainless steel I am giving to you. Now, you start analyzing the problem which is beneficial which is detrimental what happens. Suppose, a situation where the tank is open to atmosphere where the tank is close no oxygen content present here one case stainless steel second metal is steel now you apply this principle here you tell me what do you happen what will happen here in this cases. Let us take steel now ok steel the equation 1 is a problem what about the equation 2 is a problem or not problem is a problem no problem yeah problem of course the fifth is also can be a problem it is a aerated open you take a stainless steel what happens number one yeah I want to tell please tell me is a problem or not a problem it is a problem what are what was number two yeah may be problem why is that maybe it is going to decide based on who is going to examine the problem or what yeah. Tell me number 2 is it a problem or no problem 
you must have the answer now because you studied already the fundamentals in the first course I mean first part of this course right thermodynamics and kinetics you have seen. You apply this now you tell me the two is it a problem for stainless steel or not a problem for stainless steel? Huh? Come on, I want to have an answer from you. Hmm? Okay, I give answer for you. You defend. If I want, I hope I, you will defend me. Okay, I give answer for you. I say the the two is not a problem. I say the two is better. Can you defend me actually? passivity right. So, because the oxygen present in the stainless steel tank will passivate the same oxygen present in the carbon steel tank will be harmful to you actually the dilute steel things ok. So, you need to be trying to understand this now what are the things how you know it is very I mean unless you get a comprehensive idea you cannot analyze the industrial problems, but it is very simple you just apply the principles ok however complex it is they start unraveling one after another, but you need to go in this direction. So, these are all very important equations ok. So, this is how I want you to learn is what I want you to understand this equation from the thermodynamics and a kinetic point of view ok. So, I want you to get clarity in how you approach the problems actually ok. Now, let us get into this and see how we can give solution to the people ok. Now, let me just give one example of let us take the let us take the equation 1 ok. The equation 1 H plus is related to pH obviously right right. So, let us look at the pH now the pH effect. If the pH is increased what will happen to corrosion rate? What do you expect to happen of of let us say steel in water ok. What do you think will happen yeah when the pH is increased what will happen to corrosion rate decreasing ok please and you have to be firm and clear about it why why is when the pH is increasing the corrosion rate drops because S plus ions concentration is decreasing. So, the corrosion rate will things. So, there are certain things actually ok. People have also had some equation you know some trend people have found and um, this is the corrosion rate versus the, the pH uh, pH is going this way is increasing the reverse way actually ok. And something like it goes actually the trend actually ok. And you see very interesting it increases and remains stable and then you find it's very very high corrosion rate and the pH is going to be down actually here. Now, you know the boiler right I am going to now give an example and you are going to give me a solution to the particular problem ok. Let us take the case of boiler corrosion fine, but does not matter I think you guys know about boilers. What for people use boilers? Anybody? Any idea? Hmm? Why people use boilers? What for purpose? Yeah, steam generation, right? Steam is used for many purposes. Uh, one of the purposes is to generate electricity. The second is also for heating the systems in a, in a chemical process industries you use steam to heat the reactors right? you cannot go and use electrical heaters and all ok. They use steam to rise the temperature of a reaction process. So, steam is used for two purposes one is uh, you know uh, generating the, the electricity in a steam turbine other is to heat the chemical processes involved actually. Now, let us get into that. Now, you please go back to the equation and you, you, you idea is to heat the steam you are going to generate steam steam is generated for simplicity I will say they use pure water pure 
pure water is used because you do not want to form a scale and all people use pure water ok. Now, what is the temperature of the boiler actually generally anybody has a temperature a, a, any idea about it? What is the normal temperature of about about normally the, the, the water is heated about 250 to 300 degrees Celsius ok. So, you create this thing ok water is heated in the temperature range of let us say 250 to 280 something like that. The heat further to you know to increase the efficiency of the turbine that is not the point. The water is heated in 250 to 280 degrees Celsius depending upon the pressure of the boilers. What material do you think they use? Anybody? Material of construction? Stainless steel you think? Nickel based alloys, titanium alloys, stainless steel. Somebody is saying no, you tell me what material you know it. No, they use steels, ok. They use steels. At best, they use chrome steels. You know why they use chrome oil steels? The chromium and molybdenum is not meant for corrosion resistance, they are meant for creep resistance. Please make it very clear. The chromium and moly present in this one generally are not meant for corrosion resistance. Now, if you look at look around steel just exposed to atmospheric condition, water corroding heavily, right? At that temperature. 250 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius water, the boilers are supposed not corrode. In fact, the boilers life is around about 30 plus 25 plus years, ok. Some of the power plants they like to run it for 40 years. So, 40 years you are supposed to use the tube not undergoing corrosion at all or minimal corrosion undergoing. How is that possible the steel at that temperature? not undergoing corrosion. How is that possible? Whereas, the water you see around you know exposed to this you get red rush you see here right flash rust. Moment rain comes within about few hours you see a flash rust coming right. So, how is that possible here ok? How is that possible? You please take your notes and have a look at it and tell me how is it possible. So, this is your notes ok right. Tell me how is it possible that the boiler can be made resistance to corrosion yeah good. So, you know what are the what are the cathodic reaction you know what are the anodic reaction you cannot do much about anodic reaction Maybe you can do bit we will come back to this later first look at the cathodic reaction here. First of all you get it off ok you said de aeration why because the oxygen is one thing which is causing problem. So, first thing they do is they do de aeration the oxygen content is kept well below 1 ppb 2 ppb 6 ppb line of things you know ok the oxygen content is removed totally ok. But there are different type of boilers they keep oxygen content about 50 ppb so let us not worry about it, but we can say that oxygen is removed completely. Then what happens? You cannot obviously keep the H plus it is also in enemy number 1. So, how do you how do you reduce this H plus? What do you do for that? Increase the pH. So, you make the pH and slightly alkaline you are going to have you are going to be something like a situation 3, but remove this oxygen from here then what happens? Now, the corrosion rate is of the steel significantly get reduced how do you remove oxygen and all let us not discuss right now ok. That is a boiler is separate subject together ok. But this is how the principle is the principle is remove the species responsible for cathodic reaction stage 1. So, make the pH alkaline remove the oxygen content and so the corrosion rate of the boiler stops on the cathodic side. And the anodic side what you can do you can make the metal now passive 
right. Now, you have seen the Purbe diagram before right, what the Purbe diagram is? It is a potential pH diagram. If the pH is slightly alkaline, the metal can form passive films. So, you form a passive film, you remove these things. So, what happens? The steel can last for 25 30 years at that temperature with the water, no corrosion problems at all actually ok. So, the basis can be applied in order to minimize the corrosion in the field actually and it is a common practice you go to any industry any um, thermal power plant the utility is a very important thing the water treatment is a separate department altogether ok. They look at the dissolved oxygen content they monitor the H plus content actually means pH they monitor it and, uh, and then. So, the corrosion rate is now dropped of course, the metal in that case forms a nice magnetic oxide which means the passive oxides that also promotes the corrosion resistance of, of the boiler steel tubes. So, that is why the basics the fundamentals are very very essential in order to solve the corrosion problems. If you go to industry there are so many variations that happens you in fact you will not see same problem faced by other industries because after all you have human nature there are so many variations that are happening, but the basics the fundamentals are similar all through you can able to find a solution to the problem ok. You understood this one actually can I move further ok. So, when it comes to boiler uh, these things you say that ok this is so that means the basics here involved the basics are basics involved in water treatment. pH is increased then what happens you also oxygen is oxygen level is reduced and both of them leads to passivation and also leads to low cathodic reaction. Now, it is also important to understand corrosion in entirety. It is very very difficult to know what all the different environments present in industry there are millions of different environments. It is very difficult for you to make a tabulation of that actually, but you should be able to analyze the problem you should be able to address the problem ok. I will get into the other kind of environment how the corrosion can change. Look at the case of say corrosion of steel in NaCl solution. So, if you take a steel and if I measure the um, corrosion rate of the steel with the addition of um, corrosion rate versus if I plot what do you think will happen to corrosion rate? Assume that um, let us say sea water right let us say take sea water ok. Now, I want to determine the corrosion rate of the steel in in with different amount of sodium chloride solution. What do you think will happen to corrosion rate? We keep adding this we all know that sea water is very highly corrosive right right. So, what do you think will happen? It will keep increasing right. So, you say when you add sodium chloride more and more the corrosion rate would increase it is not the case ok. If you look at the corrosion rate of that you will see the corrosion rate like this.
how do you analyze this problem? You will able to analyze the problem only we understand what is the anodic reaction and what is the cathodic reaction, right? What is the anodic reaction of let us say steel in sodium chloride solution? Yeah, come on. What is the anodic reaction here? Steel. Fe will go into Fe2 plus. Fantastic. What is the cathodic reaction here? Yeah. Why hydrogen evolution coming here? Chloride. You think this will happen? You think this Cl minus plus electron becomes Cl2 minus will happen? No. Do you think that this will happen? Will happen? So, sodium chloride does not actively participate in the cathodic reaction actively does not really at all very you must understand that ok. Neither sodium can take nor chloride can take. So, what not occur. So, what is the cathodic reaction here? Yeah. So, you forget. So, this is oxygen reaction this is what happens it is oxygen reaction reduction reaction with water minus ok this occurs. Now, you must able to understand this clearly if there is no if there is no chloride in the medium only pure water neutral water exposed to air ion will corrode and combine with hydroxide and form what will happen it forms ferrous hydroxide right ferrous hydroxide formed on the surface will form reasonably protective I do not say excellent. So, the corrosion rate of steel in neutral water is less because it can form a loosely protective ion hydroxide ok. That is what will happen this two this two will happen. What does the chloride do? The chlorides they damage this oxide film. So, the corrosion rate is increasing because they damage the oxide film. Why does the corrosion rate decrease? Anybody with the chemistry background? When you add more and more chloride what happens to the solubility of oxygen in water? What happened to oxygen solubility? It drops. So, the oxygen solubility if you, if you plot if you plot the oxygen content ok. If the oxygen content if I plot the oxygen content approximately if you plot like that I am not saying exactly this is schematic huh? it is not I do not take it as the trend at all actually the oxygen level falls down. So, what happened to the overall reaction? The overall reaction will drop unless unless the cathodic reaction occurs the anodic reaction will not will not happen. So, the corrosion rate now drops actually. Now, these are some examples ok. There are several cases you see like this. The corrosion rate is dropping when you increase the uh, environment like sodium chloride. There are several other examples a couple of them I will give you, but you have to keep your see if you want to find out you can find out because library has got all kind of data ok. Only thing is you have to know oh sulfuric acid what happens with concentration. So, nitric acid what happened with the concentration you have to just go and find out then you get an answer right. You can assume things. So, you know very well we have already discussed also earlier right. We discussed already um, we already discussed also that how the corrosion rate varies the nitric acid did we discuss or not. 
corrosion of steel in dilute nitric acid, corrosion of steel in the concentrated nitric acid. When the concentration of nitric acid is increased significantly, what happened to corrosion rate? Yeah, this decreases, right? So it's changing. So that means you have to get a clear picture about how the environment affects corrosion. There is no linearity here. Please understand. I only try to derive that particular point only. Don't jump into conclusions and then say the corrosion rate is decreasing or increasing and uh, you know with, with the concentration temperature all this will not happen at all. So, there has to be an analysis I come to the only that particular point you need to analyze what is happening to cathodic reaction, what is happening to anodic reaction when you change the environment actually both cases can cha change and then automatically you come to an understanding how the corrosion will change if you alter the environment at all actually. So, that analysis are very very important simply you do not just jump to conclusion that corrosion rate will increase and sulfuric acid concentration is increased. No, do not do that ok that is going to be incorrect way of analyzing things. I think uh, there are some more issues I will uh, tell you in the next class and uh, today I think we will close and uh, we continue in the next class. I think we are going to start uh, we are going to have a class in Saturday right do that ok. So, thank you very much please read this do not read it just grossly I think the you know you must read it the way I am just trying to analyze the problems each of it you need to be reading as analysis mode not as information mode ok. If you do at information mode I think you are not going to do justice to the course at all actually ok. So, that has that has to be done.